The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session on customer lifetime value. We're going to start in just a few minutes. We've got a lot of people still joining, so we just want to wait two or three more minutes, and then we're going to get this uh, webinar going on customer lifetime value. Again, we still have a lot of people joining, so we're going to wait two more minutes and we're going to get the session going on customer lifetime value with uh, Brandon Purcell from Forrester and Julie Schmidt from Alon. So two more minutes. All right, we are ready to go. Uh, first of all, welcome to the Forrester Research Alliance Group webinar on customer value. And again, thank you for joining. I know we're all busy and we're gonna make this as impactful as possible with the content that we have. We do have a lot of great content to cover, so we're gonna get started. Uh, to do some housekeeping, I'm Tim Finnegan, the CMO of Alliance Group, uh, which is a data-driven analytics firm. And I am going to be today's host of the webinar. So just so you can sit back and, and really soak in what Julie and Brandon are going to be talking about, we're going to give you guys right after this webinar a recording of the webinar. So you'll have uh, not only all the materials, but the recording so you can go back and, and listen to it. Uh, we'd love for this to be interactive. So on your control panel, ask a question. Uh, we are definitely going to have some time at the end to uh, have some question and answer session. So. As far as the agenda today, what Brandon and Julie are going to talk about are how companies are using customer lifetime value, what are the best practices, and you know probably the number one, how to get started with uh, lifetime value. So the presenters, I am extremely pleased to introduce you uh, introduce you to the today's presenters. The first one up and the first one speaking is going to be Brandon Purcell. He's a principal analyst at Forrester Research. And he's part of their, if you're familiar with uh, Forrester Research, he's part of their customer insights team. So what he does is he covers customer analytics and artificial intelligence. Uh, and what he, what, what he really portrays is his main goal is to help organizations derive meaningful insights from their, all their customer data. Also presenting today is going to be Julie Schmidt. She is the Senior Vice President of Data Analytics and Insights at Alant Group. And really, when you talk to her, her passion is driving value through predictive analytics and data intelligence. Good. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Her primary focus is ensuring that the solutions that she provides drive strategic value and generate maximum return on investment. And we're making a huge announcement. She is also the newly appointed 
president-elect of the Chicago chapter of the American Statistical Association. So with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to uh, Brandon. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Julie. That's huge. I, I didn't know that. And uh, thank you to Tim and Julie and the Elan Group for having me. I'm particularly excited for this webinar because it came from a conversation Julie and I had uh, late last year around customer lifetime value and the difficulties that many of Elan's clients and Forrester's clients have in um, calculating and taking action upon this, this incredibly valuable metric. So hopefully we'll be able to help uh, you get started as Tim mentioned today. Tim also mentioned that I sit on our customer insights team at Forrester, which means that I write my research for folks who are tasked with understanding their customers from customer data. And um, I focus on customer analytics, so that point of, um, of transformation from data to insights. And um, let me see how to advance the slide here. Um, maybe, Tim, if you have the controls there, you can advance it. Um, so I think of customer insights as the gold buried within your, your data. Um, of course, you are probably capturing a lot of data on your customers. You've invested in some big data architecture, maybe it's Hadoop or some sort of data lake, and you know there's value there, but you need to analyze this data to, to find these, ultimately, these actionable insights that help you better understand your customers, anticipate their needs, and tailor experiences for them. Um, so you can win, serve, and retain them and grow their value. Um, so on the next slide, Tim. Hey, Brandon, um, go ahead. I, I switched it over to you. You should be able to control it. Excellent. Um, customer analytics are what turn this data into insights. So I define customer analytics as taking customer data and using analytical insight, typically some sort of machine learning or other advanced statistical process to, um, to extract insights and then ultimately design customer-focused programs that win, serve, and retain customers. And the customer-focused programs piece is very important because this is not an academic exercise. Um, we're interested in actually um, impacting the customer experience at the point of interaction based upon what we know about individual customers. The individual piece is also quite important. I'm not talking about aggregates, right? I'm not talking about uh, business intelligence and looking at the overall customer base or large segments of customers. Here we're interested in, um, in a single unit, a single customer, and um, informing that experience. And there are many ways to turn customer data into value, uh, into valuable insights. Here um, in this kind of pinwheel diagram, you can see 15 of them. Um, and they have different, um, different applications. So there are customer analytics techniques that help you with contextual marketing um, to understand customer context. Where are my customers? What are they thinking or feeling? How do they use their devices? There are, of course, customer analytics techniques that are quite suited for acquiring new customers. Every business has the goal of acquiring customers. And uh, you see behavioral segmentation here. You also see lifetime value analysis, which as we'll, we'll see in a second, is useful for the acquisition phase, the engagement phase, and the retention phase all across the customer lifecycle. Um, there are also techniques that are good for retaining customers, customer churn analysis. Many folks on the phone are probably building predictive models to predict which customers are likely to churn, especially if you're in uh, telco or maybe financial services. Um, personalization, of course, has been a big buzzword recently. The uh, analytical techniques underpinning personalization are things like next best action analysis or maybe product recommendation engines. And then finally, there are techniques to um, understand and improve the, the customer experience and customer journey analytics has been particularly popular among these. But the point of today's session is to talk about lifetime value. And I think lifetime value is uh, important to call out on its own because I look at it as um, a metric that can be tied to an individual customer that calculates not just the historical value of that customer, but also the future 
potential value of the customer and understanding that um, di should dictate how you treat that customer through various stages of the customer life cycle. So while many of these other metrics are quite tactical, customer lifetime value can be this North Star guiding metric when it comes to how you uh, acquire, engage with, and retain uh, your customers. And when we, uh, when we look at, Tim, could you uh, reverse it a couple of slides, please? Sure. to the tech radar slide, thank you. Um, when we look at uh, customer lifetime value in comparison with other analytical techniques, uh, customer lifetime value is one of the more valuable techniques and it's also uh, pretty mature as far as analytical techniques go. Um, even though many companies struggle with lifetime value, it's been around for quite some time. And uh, every year Forrester does a, um, a survey, uh, we call it the State of Customer Analytics Survey, where we survey um, about 250 analytical professionals across different verticals and we ask them things like, what types of data are you using? What are your key challenges? And we also, of course, ask them, what types of customer analytics are you performing? And as you can see here, lifetime value analysis makes the top 10. It's 58% of these people say that they are um, they're performing some time some type of customer lifetime value, um, and you know of course this could be there are varying degrees of customer lifetime value analysis which um, Julie and I will will talk to um, some of them may be doing just very standard uh, RFM analysis uh, re recency frequency frequency monetary analysis which I wouldn't say is true lifetime value analysis because you don't have that predictive or forward-looking piece to it. Um, but at least companies are starting to understand the fundamental question of how much is a customer worth? Now, unfortunately, uh, many companies don't get the value out of lifetime value um, due to several common pitfalls. So the first thing is um, really how do we calculate lifetime value and that's something that um, that was actually the uh, the conversation Julie and I had that kind of sp sparked this webinar was around calculation uh, unfortunately there's not one um, uniform calculation for lifetime value it's going to depend on a number of different factors but once you figure out what the right formula is there's also you know what data do we need of course you need data on on transactional data right on revenue from customers um, but where many people um, struggle is accounting for cost some customers cost more to acquire and certainly to serve than other customers how do you actually uh, figure that into the equation um, but it's not just, it's not all about the data and the calculation. It's also about internal socialization of this metric. Uh, one thing we'll, we'll discuss is that CLV is, um, is not an accurate metric, meaning that if my projected value um, in my relationship with, let's say, Comcast in the future is um, $2,000, it's not going to be exactly $2,000. And some teams, particularly finance, because they're used to very accurate metrics that tie together um, have a hard time adopting this and um, and finally you know if it's not accurate how do we constantly improve this so how much is a customer worth well like I said I wish that there was a uniform equation for this but it actually depends on a couple of different factors um, so the first one is the type of relationship that your customers have with you. Are they in a contractual relationship with you, like in telco, um, or in some sort of subscription-based service where there is a definite point of churn? This customer is a customer today, and they've unsubscribed, and they're no longer a customer? Or is it a non-contractual relationship, like in retail, where a Target customer could go into Target this week and then potentially never shop there again for, for multiple different reasons. Um, and so if you have this non-contractual relationship, lifetime value actually ends up being a bit more difficult because you have to rely on a more probabilistic model. What is the likelihood of a customer coming back again and again and again over their lifetime? Whereas if you're a telco or you know some sort of subscription-based business, there you can 
uh, build a churn model to determine the propensity of individual customers to churn, and that's, that becomes the lifetime, uh, the expected lifetime piece of the equation. Um, now there's also the value piece, which brings us to the y-axis of this. So the types of transactions customers have with you. Um, is it probabilistic in that we don't know how much each transaction is going to be. When I go to the grocery store, I may pay, you know, I may spend 20 bucks, I may spend $150, depending on how much food I'm stocking up on. That makes it, again, more difficult and you have to rely on a more probabilistic model. Um, if you have discrete or known values of your transactions, for instance, if you subscribe to mail order prescriptions, well, you can actually predict with great accuracy what the value of that transaction is going to be every month or three months. Um, and that makes the, the value piece a little easier while you're trying to figure out uh, the lifetime piece. So all of those, those factors influence how you calculate lifetime value. But at the end of the day, um, the two main pieces are, of course, lifetime and uh, value. Now, a lot of folks think, okay, CLV should exist in a vacuum uh, metric in and of itself. And if you recall back to that pinwheel diagram, you'll remember the kind of confusing arrows in the middle of it. Those arrows denote the fact that oftentimes customer analytics techniques, CLV chiefly among them, are used with other techniques in conjunction with other techniques. And some of the ways people use CLV is with churn propensity. So let's say you're predicting customer's likelihood of churning and you have, you know, a thousand customers who have a high likelihood of leaving. Well, you may not have the resources to give all thousand of those an incentive to stay. So a lot of companies actually cross-reference that churn score with their lifetime value to prioritize which customers are we actually going to spend money on retaining. Um, CLV may also be useful with product propensities. So how likely is it that a specific customer is, if you're a bank, let's say to take on an auto loan or a mortgage, you're probably going to spend more marketing to customers with a higher lifetime value. Um, service propensities as well. We'll see a case in a second where you may actually differentiate the customer service experience and give a uh, high lifetime value member um, a better, uh, better experience, a more, more white glove experience. And then uh, finally, lifetime value um, and natural language processing or text analytics. So a lot of companies are turning to the text data generated by um, customer feedback channels to identify pain points in the customer experience. And very sophisticated companies are actually um, cross-tabbing that with customer lifetime value. So what are the main pain points of my highest lifetime value customers? Maybe I should prioritize fixing those pain points um, over the ones that just um, impact uh, the universal customer base. So CLV, as you can tell, has, is useful across the customer life cycle. And um, if you look at the, the dotted line in this diagram, that represents the, the value of a customer to you without doing lifetime value analysis. And of course, the solid line is the value of that customer with lifetime value analysis. And you can see at the beginning of the customer journey where customers are just starting to discover your brand and explore their options, if you're able to allocate marketing budget to the channels that deliver the highest value customers, and here you'd probably be doing some sort of lookalike analysis where you see who your highest lifetime value customers are today, and you look for prospects who look like them. Well, there you'd probably be using lifetime value segments um, combined with lookalike targeting. Once a customer has converted, or even at that point of conversion, you can try to sell them more stuff if you realize that they have a high lifetime value. Um, and over that customer life cycle there, you can also start to do cross-sell and upsell analysis or recommendation analysis to extract uh, more value from people who have a higher um, higher unrealized lifetime value. And then finally, as I mentioned before, at the end of the customer life cycle, you can focus your retention or even your win back efforts if customers have left you um, on the folks who are who are worth that that investment. So let's look at um, a service, a differentiated service interaction based on lifetime value analysis. So 
this is a customer who is in, in a chat and they are a tier one um, CLV and they have a high um, service propensity. So Mrs. Smith goes on to her airline and says, I'm trying to make a reservation. The customer service rep um, determines that she is uh, in the highest tier of lifetime value. Um, and she has a high propensity to need some sort of service. So the agent says, hi, Mrs. Smith, I see you're having trouble with your reservation to Los Angeles. So they already know that what she was trying to do. Let me help you with that. Um, thank you for your help. They fix the problem. And then because um, they've also identified that Mrs. Smith has a high churn propensity and she's a frequent consumer of Wi-Fi on those flights, um, they offer her um, an incentive to stay. They give her a positive experience by offering her uh, free Wi-Fi. So that's what may happen in a service experience with a high value customer. Now let's see what happens with a lower value customer. So this, this customer falls into the lowest tier of lifetime value for the airline. Same thing, trying to make a reservation. Um, however, in this case, instead of going being directed to a human, um, they're directed to a chatbot, obviously a less costly customer service solution. So the chatbot says, I'd be happy to assist you with that. Now the customer says, I'm tired of dealing with your awful website. I'm going to take my business elsewhere. So here, text analytics picks up on the negative sentiment in the experience and also um, the risk of churn for this customer. And so now based on business rules of this airline, the conversation gets routed or handed off to a human agent um, who now can uh, resolve the problem and try to ultimately rectify the relationship. The one thing I, I really like as a former data scientist, and, and Julie and I nerd, nerd out about this stuff, is that life time value often calls into question um, commonly held intuition versus what the data says. And, you know, my whole ethos at Forrester is around understanding customers from your data um, as opposed to only gut feel. I'm, I'm not disparaging gut feel completely, but if the data says something else, I'm going with the data every time. And that's what um, this one uh, insurance company wanted to find out. So they wanted to find out whether Medicare customers, so people who are 65 plus, who are looking for additional Medicare benefits, whether they become more or less profitable with age. So they could decide um, whether to target and nurture the relationships of the um, recently turned 65 versus the 70, 80, and nonagenarian uh, populations. So, you know, I usually ask them, uh, uh, clients, what do you think? You know, do people become more or less profitable with age? And sort of the common consensus is that as people age, they get sick and they consume more of their medical benefits. And of course that impacts their profitability negatively. Um, so the intuition is that people become less profitable with age, but the data doing lifetime value analysis, HAP Insurance based in Michigan found that um, these people actually become 4% more profitable for each month of tenure. So they actually set about uh, retention programs to try to retain these people as they age because they are becoming more profitable. Um, but it, it countered the, the intuition that folks become less profitable with age. Let's look at some other companies who are using lifetime value and actually getting, uh, getting some value out of it. So this is probably my favorite lifetime value case study. It's from Royal Bank of Canada. They wanted to understand or they wanted to identify sub-segments of customers who are becoming or entering into a relationship with them, but are pretty broke, right? Um, but that they're going on to become some of their highest value customers over time. So they performed a lifetime value analysis and find and found this subsegment of the population that was massively in debt because they'd just gone to medical or dental school and they were incurring more, more debt because they were opening their practices, they were buying equipment and office space, um, but ultimately they were going on to become some of their best customers. And by identifying this segment and then creating products and services specifically for them, they were able to uh, increase their market share in the medical and dental professional segment in Canada from 2% to 18%, and these people are worth almost four times their average customer. Um, so that was a particularly good use of lifetime value analysis to find the right customers to attract and invest in. 
um, XO uh, Communications, a Verizon company, um, also uses customer lifetime value. In this case, it cross-references value with retention efforts. So like many B2B companies, they have a large number of, of enterprise clients, um, but then a much larger number of mid-sized businesses. And they needed to understand, okay, where should client service managers um, uh, spend their, their time um, nurturing business and, and ultimately retaining folks. So they developed a churn model to determine which of these folks, which of these businesses were most likely to leave. And then they deployed a team of 25 new client service managers to try to retain the ones that had the highest, um, highest lifetime value. And this was phenomenally successful for them. They experienced an ROI of 376% with an average annual benefit of $4 million. Finally, we'll turn to a company that everyone on the line, I'm sure, is familiar with, Netflix. Um, so Netflix wanted to understand the lifetime value of its customers. This was back when um, pre-streaming, when it was uh, the mail order service. And um, they understood that the average um, customer value per month was $11.65. Um, and doing churn analysis, they also determined that the average customer lifetime um, was 25 months, so a little over two years. And so, you know, being a marketer, would you want to invest $150 to acquire and serve a customer? Does that make business sense for Netflix? Well, if you do the customer lifetime value analysis on that, and again, this is aggregate, and there, you know, a, a good lifetime value analysis will look at individual customers, but in aggregate, the average lifetime value of a Netflix customer is almost $300. So of course you'd be willing to spend 150 to acquire and serve one, although ultimately any marketer would love to reduce that cost. So a few final recommendations before I turn it over to Julie here. First of all, aim for progress, not perfection. So one of um, one of the issues with lifetime value is, is the metric is never going to be perfect, right? But ultimately, you're going to be using it, like I said, to differentiate experiences, maybe to tier or segment customers and differentiate experiences that way. And so progress is good enough. You don't have to worry about getting it perfect, which leads into my next, uh, my next point, which is that CLV is precise but approximate. And by that, I mean... Precision meaning that CLV ultimately expresses itself as a number in dollars and cents. So when someone, particularly someone from finance, sees that, they think it's accurate. But it's not. It's an approximate value. And so I wouldn't take um, action based on an individual customer's lifetime value score. Certainly wouldn't make financial projections based on that. But I would decide how to differentiate that customer's experience based on that, that number, and that number, especially in relation to other customers. So it's precise, but approximate. And finally, um, the key use of CLV is to guide customer journeys across the life cycle. Once again, this isn't just about acquisition. It's not just about retention. It's about nurturing lifetime value to extract um, the full lifetime value of a customer throughout that customer's life with you. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Julie Schmidt, who's the Senior Vice President of Analytics at Alant, and she'll talk to you about how Alant is using lifetime value to help their clients. Thanks, Brandon. One of the things that I really um, liked about um, what Brandon was talking about, and one of the things that resonates most is using CLV as a, is the North Star guiding metric, if I captured that quote correctly, Brandon. And I think one of the reasons why this is so relevant today is that now we have even more powerful machine learning tools and techniques that are allowing us to actually be more accurate than just you know, kind of got being get, guided by the stars and really more of a GPS, maybe not the most accurate GPS as Brandon just talked about, but a more primitive GPS um, where we're getting closer and closer to kind of a source of truth specifically for that for that future value calculation. So, uh, Tim, I don't know, am I be able to push this forward? Yeah, okay, great. So, uh, taking Brandon's data insights and action metric uh, image that you saw earlier, just want to quickly um, talk about how Alant has adopted um, this life cycle in order to help our clients um, really transition the gaps from data to insights and insights to action. 
through um, the analytics gap from turning that data into a action and we'll, or insights, and we'll talk about um, how we do that, um, turning insights into action through campaign management, implementation, and execution, and then ultimately being able to measure that action through um, through driving that data back into your CRM systems and ultimately being able to optimize your marketing spend as a result of that. We have adopted this um, into our overview. This is the Alant overview slide of if we showed kind of one slide of what Alant does. Um, this is our capability slide. And you'll see in the, in the center there at its core is this data, insights, and action uh, paradigm. So, you know, as um, Tim introduced a lot, we're bringing in all of this data on the left-hand side where, we're, where our clients are touching their um, customers, bringing in second and third party data, and then on the right-hand side, we're executing omni-channel campaigns. So the kind of the, the core wheel in the middle there are um, the capabilities of Alant, and I'm not gonna walk you through them um, all in detail, but what I do wanna do is walk you through why, um, why these, these capabilities position us to deliver CLV solutions specifically for our clients. So the first piece is, is really standard data wrangling. It's the, it's the idea that in any analytics or any machine learning solution, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so that data wrangling and being able to pull that information from multiple silos is critical. As we're talking about pulling data from multiple silos, and I'll talk about kind of the, the calculation and what data is required, but the ability to link information across systems to know that Jay Schmidt at Alant Group is the same as Julie Hedrick at 123 Main Street in these different systems is critical, and Alant has um, those capabilities as well. The, la the last piece on the data hub is really about being able to enhance the first party data you have in order to um, identify other pieces of information that are gonna help you identify high value customers, like Brandon talked about, whether it's being able to find lookalike customers, Alant houses multiple sources of third party data where we enhance these solutions so that um, we can get better predictions both of prospects future value as well as new customers because your first party data is really limited for new customers. And then we shift over to, of course, my favorite part, which is the actual algorithms and estimation, which sort of brought Brandon and I together in talking about CLV in the first place. And, I, and I'll go through kind of how we go about that in more detail. But activating that really becomes being able to put those algorithms into a customer data platform. And so um, for a lot, that means our model scoring framework where we're able to monitor, um, deploy uh, models so that ultimately, we can either take action or our clients can take actions by segmenting their customers through um, the CLV solutions. So that's a bit of an overview of, of why Alant is even talking about this. And uh, Brandon and I had a little fight over who was gonna get to show the formula and I won. Um, <laughs> uh, if we break down the math though, Brandon talked about um, current value and future value. And, and I will say that if, if you Google Less customer lifetime value calculations, you'll probably find a hundred of them and, and none of them are actually going to be this because I've been using this for over 10 years, um, but I like it. So I'm going to keep using it. Um, the formula really breaks down into current value as Brandon talked about and the, that future value prediction. So I'm just going to break this down a little bit without necessarily going through all of the, um, the, the tiny minute math pieces, but the first piece is taking this on the current value side, taking that gross contribution, that cost to serve, I don't know if you could see my arrow here, that cost to marketing, and as Brandon said, start small and add over time. Maybe you don't necessarily even have the cost to serve immediately, so you're only going to use the marketing cost and some margin contribution, and I'll talk about that in a second. The, really, the hardest part of this is um, the the prediction of the cadence and timing and frequency of the future transactions for your customers. And as Brandon talked about contractual versus non-contractual, this is even harder in the non-contractual sense So for all the, the retailers out there. Um, and, and slightly less difficult for the contractual, but you still have the, the churn and the upgrade and the downgrade that you want to predict as well. When we get into the actual value pieces of this equation, this is really kind of the second hardest part, but it's really tied to, it's, it's going to be as accurate as the data that you have on the current value side, because you're going to be leveraging that current value of previous transactions to predict future value, future uh, value component of that. And then lastly, it's the 
how far out are we really going to go with this? So um, at a lot, we use a 12 month and 24 month window standard for, for most of our retail clients, um, as well as for our contractual telco and insurance clients. Um, but this is really dependent on um, the, the life cycle of your product sale, as well as how much historical data do you have? And there's, a, there's other dependencies as well. So that's the formula. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details of the formula, but um, wanted to walk you through how we actually go through the process of calculating these things. So if we talk about process, it starts with um, gathering data and defining use cases, which is really when we think about uh, data insights and action is the data piece of that. Um, the second then is in looking at the calculations. And as, as Brandon talked about, there's many different approaches from a survival approach, um, Markov approaches, probabilistic approaches. Um, we leverage many approaches even for the same client to find the, the right algorithm for that for that client and for that data really we're looking at for the highest accuracy and then ultimately we're talking about implementing those through um, both in a test case but then rolling those out so that um, those scores are developed they, they're developed but they're updated over time and installed into the production environments which is really the action um, piece of this again um, the idea where, where Brandon was talking about in his recommendations progress not perfection um, let's not let the enemy be the perfect the let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good right so um, using what data is available today and then growing on that over time so we like to take a phased approach the simplest approach is really to take behavioral history the transactional data applying some some margin component to that be it your cost of goods sold or an, an, a margin by product line and then marketing costs and um, the more accurate and the more detailed data you get around this, the, the stronger these predictions are going to be. But then eventually adding in that cost to service. If a customer, as, as Brandon talked about Comcast, if I call customer service five times and I have a truck come to my house at least once a month, even if I have the same pr products as the people next door, I'm going to be less um, profitable for Comcast. And really true profitability comes down to applying overhead and, and other fixed costs to this as well. So this is the more kind of detailed approach as we go into the, the different algorithms that um, we have available to us. Um, there, there are segment level approaches that you can take on the always a share side. Um, that's what the Markov chains are doing on the, the always a share non-contractual piece on the top. Um, really looking at where customers fall um, from a segment perspective and then looking at migration from one segment to the other and estimating the value and probabilities of those segments over time. And then we have other probabilistic models, which I'm going to drill in to on the next slide, but really talks about exactly what um, Brandon was talking about, the probability of transaction and then the associated value of those transactions. And there's different statistical algorithms that you can use um, to estimate those. On the contractual side, which is on the bottom there, or what we, we call lost for good, um, is really where we're looking at survival analysis and churn modeling. And on the more precise versions, we're also looking at not just likelihood to churn, but likelihood to upgrade or downgrade. So because your likelihood to churn changes based on um, what product mix you typically have um, in these contractual um, environments. So let me drill down a little bit um, further into probabilistic models. There's, there's, there's one more kind of split within these different probabilistic models, which is um, talking about a um, a pre-existing condition. So the, the simplest way of explaining this is um, the idea that um, I can't attend a conference if that conference isn't happening, right? So there has to be a pre-existing condition versus in typical retail, there's no pre-existing condition. There's, there's no um, need for me to go and buy clothes for my daughter because she doesn't need any, but I'm going to go and do it anyway, right? Um, there are multiple uh, approaches to these. I've actually just laid out a couple here. Um, there, are, there are many different uh, distributions that you can model using exponential or Poisson or geometric or um, NBD, the negative binomial distribution. And really our approach is to not say one size fits all. We're going to leverage multiple approaches and then um, find the one that, that fits best. At the bottom, there's a, a different calculation and different um, distributions or algorithms that we're fitting for the, the actual spend or profitability piece of this as well. And really those two things go together. So when, when I'm talking about all these different modeling approaches, I'm also talking about the future value piece because the current value um, is, is actually more simple to create other than making sure that you're getting that data integrated from all those different sources. 
So the process is really iterative, like I said. So we've standardized this process where um, at, on the kind of lower end of the phases of bringing in customer data, sales data, and marketing cost data, um, we iterate on many different things, not just the algorithms themselves that are listed here, but there's things like are there different customer segments or different customer cohorts that have very different um, transaction cadence that would require a different model to be fit for those. So you may have one CLV solution, there may be 10 models underneath that based on different customer cohorts or customer segments. Um, another simple example is handling of outliers. Outliers obviously are always going to affect your final algorithms, so you want to make sure that you're handling those in a way that still allow you to identify your most profitable customers. So. In, in, a, in an example kind of POC that we did for a client, and I'll, and I'll give you an example in a second, um, we literally will do hundreds of different combinations of these algorithms and then pick the algorithm that's really best um, fitting that data. So what does that look like? And the simplest example, when I talked about multiple customer cohorts and multiple segments, um, this is an example where we take one cohort of data. This is using three years of transactional data for a retailer. We're taking that first two years and we're calibrating the models to say, for especially on the transaction side, but also on the dollar side to say, what is the cadence and what is the, the frequency of typical transaction before this cohort specifically. And then we have a one year holdout period on the back end, which allows us then to say, how accurate is this prediction? Now, when we actually go to roll this out, we actually are rolling them out, leveraging all of the data that you have up to the point of time um, that you're actually running the algorithm so that you have the most accurate calculation. But this is really what allows us to measure which algorithm or which process should we be using. Two different ways of measuring that. Typical standard way from, an, from a statistical perspective is through the gains tables and looking at um, in this case, we're looking at quintiles or demideciles or 5% buckets, looking at actual versus projected um, dollars. These, this data has been masked, um, just, but it's directionally accurate. Um, the, the thing to point out here, especially in retail, you often have um, half of your customer file that has zero future value. So you have a lot of one and dones. And so the, the least accurate piece is here, but very much um, it is still our lowest dollar projection. Um, on the uh, at the bottom of the, the rank there. So we're not just looking though at those um, 5% groups because we also want to understand the deviation within them. So there could be a pretty wide spread within each of those 5% groups. And what we do is we look at the accuracy of at a customer level, this full 1.7 million customers, how many customers got put in the exact right bucket and or one deviation away from that. Um, in this case, we had several models. When we modeled it at a, at a segment level, it was about a 56%, which actually is not that bad as a starting point for segment level calculations. Um, but the, the best algorithm that we used was 77% accurate. So Brandon gave a lot of uh, great examples of, of how different folks are using uh, customer lifetime value and um, how that fits into the customer life cycle. This is kind of our one page version of that um, same information and with really kind of on the X axis having the customer life cycle of acquisition, growth, retention, and win back. And then um, on the Y axis, customer lifetime value. And so I get that X axis can kind of cross really anywhere. You want to think of it as crossing where um, the value is uh, right at zero, right? Uh, but really breaking customers down into potentially many more segments than we've identified, but those that you want to grow that are new to their life cycle and have the potential, those that are already high value, but they're early in their life cycle and their growth phase and you want to continue to um, maintain that relationship. And those that are on, um, on the back side, as, as Brandon talked about on the win back side, really being able to differentiate those customers that you want to re-engage or those customers that you want to divest. So how do we technically do that? Um, Alant has a long time partnership with IBM and we leverage the IBM Watson marketing suite of tools. Campaign over here is really the, the heavy lifting engine to do that. That is the, the, the old, it used to have the name Unica, but now we're just calling it campaign. Um, really allows us to segment, the fi segment your file in many different ways, um, provide different offers, different treatments to different groups. Um, 
And UBX is really, think of UBX as just the data bus that's bringing all the different data sources from many different sources together so that you can do um, real-time triggers and understanding in the case study that Brandon was talking about with the chat box, you know, if this is a high-value customer, I need to know right away so that I can actually lead them to live customer agent versus the chat box. So UBX is pulling that in real time and then in, in reading the analytics components to make sure that you're treating those customers um, as needed. And then the last piece is WCA, the Watson Campaign Automation Tools that are really the, the deployment engine for all of the channels that are listed below, specifically on email, uh, mobile push, and SMS, um, that, that is really part of the um, marketing cloud over here. Quickly, a POC that for another um, case study that I want to talk about is um, for an, an actual cable provider, Volant. And this was an interesting case that already had a product centric. Hey, Julie, I think we're, um, Julie, hey, Julie, I think we're losing you a little on this. So, uh, why don't we go right to, since we're running towards the end, why don't we do the question and answer right now? I'm going to ask Brandon a question. Maybe we can get your audio back working. Um, but I tell you what, this has been a lot of great content. And, hey, Brandon, there's a question coming through for you, and it's asking how many years' worth of sales data and marketing costs do you recommend including uh, to calculate an effective CLV metric? Mm, how many years? Yeah, that's... Well, it's a tough question because it really it's, it really depends. It depends on the cadence with which your customers transact with you. So, you know, for a typical, like let's say a retailer um, where a large portion of your customers, maybe greater than 50% transact with you um, more than once a year, then you probably still need about three years of data um, to be able to furnish a, uh, a, a accurate lifetime value or a lifetime value with the threshold of accuracy that, let's say, Julie just uh, just described that 77% accuracy, which was quite impressive. Um, but you know, not everyone's in that situation, right? I've spoken to automotive manufacturers who'd like to calculate the lifetime value of their customers, and um, you know, people buy cars every you know five years or so, and there you're going to need a, a lot more data um, on a, you know, historical basis. Okay, great. Hey, Julie, we're going to try you on this one. If not, we can have Brandon handle it. But the question that came through um, during your presentation was, besides the obvious sales data and marketing costs, what other types of data points are useful to include when you're doing the CLV calculation? So can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Not to use the uh, the marketing tagline from the company that Brandon was using. Um, yeah. So um, other data, I think um, the 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 after marketing costs, the customer service, the cost to serve, right? So um, in in the cable example, it was um, customer service and truck rolls. Um, but any other of the major, I would say, look at your um, profitability and look at what are the major components of um, profitability and start with with the bigger pieces right I had a, a client about eight years ago that had um, a pretty detailed profitability metric where they were even allocating the distribution centers cost per square foot for anybody that was purchasing online so I think that that's um, extreme um, but um, could, could get as as detailed as you want but I would start with um, cost to serve customer service and customer care um, and any um, of those components. Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. And we have one last question, Brandon. This one's coming in from you. Uh, and I think you touched on it, but what the attendee really wants to know is that once you have all the customer data in place, like what's next? Like how do you decide which techniques to use? Mm. Well, there, I mean, that first part, once you have all the customer data in place, is typically the the longest part of the process, right? Because most companies' customer data resides in disparate systems, and um, and reconciling that at the 
individual customer level can be very difficult, tedious, and time-consuming. But once you are in that state, well, then you have to start thinking about um, giving your business objectives. Um, what makes the most sense and what makes the most sense is usually driven by things like okay we're you know we are our raison d'etre is to acquire new customers so we're going to do lifetime value analysis and use it in addition with lookalike modeling to try to acquire more customers and, and more profitable customers and at the same time reduce our our marketing costs um, however if you're maybe you're in telco and your business revolves around churn um, and so there, your business objective would dictate that you would do churn analysis and identify these folks who are likely to leave and try to save them, especially if they're worth more money. Um, or maybe you're, you sit on the customer experience side of the house, and so you're interested in identifying pain points and, and fixing them. And you can use customer lifetime value in conjunction with that to determine, hey, what are my high-value segment customers saying that they need, and how can we better furnish mission experience um, for them. So at the end of the day, lifetime value and really any customer analytics technique needs to be preceded by a very serious conversation where you and your key stakeholders within the business articulate and define your key business objectives. You're going to measure the result of any sort of analytical project. Okay. Thanks, Brandon. And actually, this one just came in. I really want to ask this because there's like uh, 20 uh, exclamation points after it. But the question is to either Julie or Brandon. Have you seen financial services companies calculate a CLV for channel partners as well as end customers like policyholders? Well, this is Brandon. I do have some experience with um, with lifetime value. Um, I have not seen that um, financial services uh, partners calculate CLV for, for channel partners. However, I could see its usefulness because, you know, uh, channel partners don't necessarily have all of the data necessary to be able to calculate that on their own. And they also, they honestly may not just have the analytical resources to be able to do so, while, whereas a financial services company probably has access to more data and more resources. And so that could be a kind of win-win situation um, where the financial services company ultimately benefits from the channel partner having and being able to take action on this additional uh, insight. All right. Thanks for jumping in, Brandon. I just want to thank both Brandon and Julie for sharing all this great knowledge and content. But this brings you into the, the event today. Um, speaking of content, hey, follow Alant Group and Forrester on LinkedIn and Twitter because both of us are constantly posting original content to ultimately help marketers. But what, what's coming to you guys is over the next 24 hours, we're going to provide copies of the material and the recording uh, so you have it. All right. Uh, and if you have any additional questions for Julia Brandon, please send them to me. My email is in all the communication that's coming out and that's going to be coming out in the forward. So, again, thank you very much for taking time uh, out of your day and uh, please have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.